Welcome along to the latest off the ball remote road show with thanks to Cadbury FC. Between them, our guests have more silverware than a pair of pearly kings. It's a Cockney special with London's own Ian Wright and Saul Campbell. And first, here's your host, Nathan Murphy. All right, thanks for joining us on OTB Sports. We have got two Premier League legends for you today. This is the second of this year's OTB Sports Remote Roadshows in partnership with Cabri FC. Check out cabriefc.com for updates on promotions and giveaways. Let's get to our special guests. They are two legends of North London. Between the two of them, they were part of all three of Arsenal's Premier League title winning sides. Saul Campbell and Ian Wright, hello. Hey, Nathan, how are you doing? Hey. I'm very well. We're going to talk about uh, the Arsenal days. Of course, your Arsenal days didn't cross paths. You had times with England together and you would have come up against each other many times through the years in North London derbies in particular. But would you have spent much time together in recent years? Are Arsenal a club who are very good at keeping former players together and involved? I know, let right answer that one. Well, so, the thing, well, the thing with um, what's, what's always open at Arsenal is there's always a welcome for you. Um, you only have to make a call if you want to go to a game, um, you know, and, and you, you, you know, and, and it's done. They, they'll lay, they'll lay out the carpet for you, make you, make you very welcome, very comfortable. It's always, um, it's always been like that. So, Especially with the legend, legendary players. Of if course. I don't want to say my story, legend, <laughs> you know, but the fact is, the players that have played their their part, it's um, you always get a welcome. I would agree to that. I think Arsenal, uh, you know. They have that sense of uh, tradition. It's quite nice having that um, amongst a lot of clubs who that maybe that goes by the wayside. So um, they like to, you know, all of you know, back in the day, the marble halls and things like that. They love to kind of, even though now it's a different, you know, the stadium's different, and they still try to, and they are keeping the uh, that kind of family touch. Yes, right, you know, is, is right. You pick up the phone, and if you want to go to a game. Or, you know, maybe not 10 tickets, but I may be able to sort a couple of tickets to watch a game. Going back to your playing days, Saul, particularly when you were starting out in the game and you would have been playing against Ian in North London derbies, was Ian Wright mm. as much of a nightmare to play against as everybody says? I think with Ian, you know, he used to be a pain, obviously. You know, I remember sometimes he used to uh, try to chat to me and, and, <laughs> and it's like... I can't get into your head. And I remember, you know, going to England, he, he was all always talking about, I just can't get into his head. But for me, Rice, he was, uh, you know, you know electrifying centre forward. He he could pounce on anything. He could make, you know, make someone make a mistake. He could dart in. He could do a lovely curl uh, into the top corner. He could dive in a diving header. You know, Rice, he, you know, coming from, you know, the background, he, you know, and also the upbringing and also not getting into football as quick as everyone else, you know, that hunger, desire has kind of lasted him all the way through his career. So, you know, he's he like a goal poacher. You know, at Palace, he was fantastic, and you know, scoring in the, you know, in the finals of, uh, against Man United. So, you know, and it just travelled on. And from that move into, into Arsenal, just, you know, he just went from strength to strength, but kept that desire and that cool finish behind... Uh, the, the, the rough outplay, but when he was front of goal, he's cool and collected and cool finisher. Ian Wright. The thing is, what, I, what I'd say about Son Nathan is, is that he's, he's, he's absolutely right because I used to, I used to constantly try to talk to defenders, try to put them off the game so that you could get, you could get any kind of edge. But Street honestly, <laughs> and honestly, the thing with Sol is that he literally can look at you like he's looking through you, um, like you're not there. And what I always tried to do, I had to make sure that I didn't get close to him because if I got close to Sol anywhere with the ball or anything, he would always dispossess you. Too strong, too quick, read the game too well. And the only way I could really get anything from Sol is if something happened like the goals I would score, the flick on in the box and you, you, you lose people and he's not marking you in particular. But it's very difficult, Nathan, simply because of how quick and how he read the game very well. For someone who started as a, as a centre forward, you know, the way he switched to, to defensive and part of the invincible team was just, it was an amazing um, transition for him, but t really hard to play against, really tough to play against. You were, by all accounts, Ian, a legendary sledger that you had a lot to say to centre-backs. How long would you give it if you were going up against Saul Campbell and you realised he wouldn't react, that actually it had no effect on him? W would you give it a half? I mean, would you give it a match? No, you, you don't stop, Nathan. You know, just because... Just because he's not listening, <laughs> you don't stop. 
You know, that's the thing. You've got to keep going. You've got to try and annoy him. And this is what I'm saying with Soul. Is, you know, you, you can see him. He, you know, he will not pay any ten attention. Like, you'll get people where you'll keep going at them, and at some stage, Nathan, they will say something. As soon as they've said something, I know I've got them because then you know that they've reacted. So their mind can be played with, and then you can get that mistake. And then I can say things like, our manager told us to play on you. You're the one he said to play on. You were the main, you were the main focus point in our, in our team talk. Once they answer, if they don't answer, you can't go to the next level of sledge. <laughs> <laughs> I used to love it because I come from Sunday morning, and that's all we've done on Sunday morning is just continue to wind people up. But so did ne he never, ever took the bait, ever. Uh, I'm sure it wasn't all I think, as I think that, as that for, for me, I think people don't realise... Um, I'm from like like variety. I'm from really a rough background. Don't forget my clothes now. Uh, you know, Plasto, Stratford when Stratford was just rougher than not Stratford now, you know, fantastic gleaming, you know, Westfield. That was when that was a dump and factories and a big, huge kind of mound of stone. You know, I've got fish fish places in there and Plasto, Stratford. So you'd get this um you get people, you know, cussing each other, things like that on the street. And so you kind of learn, for me, over the years, you learn to just kind of keep your cool and, and just concentrate on, on the job at, at hand or or just kind of seeing through them and getting on with your day. So <laughs> obviously I'm from that type of environment where all that cussing was going on. And um, so it almost, you know, grounded me and gave me a little bit of, a, a little bit of practice to kind of just block out things. <laughs> so how were you so zen then the whole way through, Saul? If you came from that similar background, how is it that, that you never seem to react during your career, that you're pretty much unflappable? Yeah, you no, know, sometimes you do react. I mean, I'm not perfect, no chance. I've, I've reacted. I mean, you got, you're not human, but there, there's, there, when you're playing, there's certain players, you know, that you don't want to react to. And Wright is obviously one of those. So you kind of you pick and choose the players over the years. Like, you know what? Just 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 kind of concentrate on your game and just get through this game because I'm not gonna bite, I'm not gonna take the bait, I ain't got time for it. Just, let me just do my job today. And there's others like, oh yeah, whatever, you have a bit of banter with them, and you know, and then you move on. But I always kind of just um kept it cool and, and concentrated and 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 just picked and choose my uh, uh the guys I just wouldn't react to or, or might just have a little nibble every now and again. So who were the it's ones good to have some banter anyway. It's nice to have a bit of banter <laughs> on the pitch as well. Who who were the ones you really looked forward to playing against Dean? Who were the ones you knew you could get at? Um well to be honest it's Steve Bruce, Gary Pallister, um Rada, oh, you know what I mean? Like Des Walker was Des Walker was the total opposite to Soul. I couldn't get a word in with Des Walker because <laughs> Des was telling you when you make a run against someone like Des Walker, he said, "Well, I'm not even going to, I'm not going to fall for that run because your midfielder hasn't even got enough time on the ball for you to be making that." So Des is actually telling you what you can't do in your own game. <laughs> so it was difficult for Des. He was quick. He was strong. You know, what I mean, he read the game unbelievably well. You know the song, "You'll Never Beat Des Walker." You know what I mean? And you try something and he'd come from somewhere, just take the ball off, you give it to someone. The Forest fans started singing that. So he was he was really tough to play against because me and him were trying to get a word in. Um, and, and you know, look, like Lucas Rodebi, another one, you know, he was another one that looked at you but didn't say much. But what Lucas would do, he would smile. That would be enough for me as well. If he smiled, that means I've got somewhere. You know, so that's another thing. And there's certain defenders who I wouldn't speak to because you have to make them feel, I'm not speaking to you. You're not worthy of me speaking to you. I'm going to beat you without having to get into your head. And I used to say that to them. I'm not, I don't need to, you know, like sometimes you go up to them, Nathan, and, you, and they'll say as soon as you get there, don't come with your rubbish today, righty, because, you know what I mean, it's not going to happen today. And I'd say to them, I'm not even going to speak to you. You're not one of the defenders I'm worried about. So then, you know what I mean, you don't speak to them. So then what happens is they say, they, they said he normally speaks, but he's not speaking. So you get into their head that way. But I, everybody else apart from someone like Rio, Rio was vexed with me because when Rio was younger, he really liked me and everything. Same with Michael Dubry. And then the first thing I'd done with them was absolutely slaughter them about the way they looked, how they played and weird stuff like that. And like, I remember when they came off, they say, I hate Ian, right? I hate him. When you speak to them once we finish, we have a laugh about it. They say they hated me. 
But the fact is, I would speak and try to get through to everybody. And there's some people who say, well, I'm not going to get much out of Soul, I'm not going to get much out of Lu Lucas Fidelli, Look, but people like Ruddock and Steve Bruce and all them ones, you know, all the other guys, I'll get something. That's why I scored against them. <laughs> And you were obviously loved by the supporters in not just Arsenal fans. I think all football supporters love the way you approach the game. But within the game at that stage, if you're that mouthy, like, did people were, were you liked by your contemporaries when when you went into England camp? Was there any was there any hangover from all that? No, of course not. It's part of it. There was a lot of mouthy people in England. There. <laughs> <laughs> he, fitted his, he fitted right in. <laughs> if it, if, if the good about it is, is that when you consider the, the, the players you had at the time, as Gaza and Incy and everybody was there, all the people that was there, um, you know, it was a case of what can you find out that you can use against them, you know, when you're together, because, you know, me and Incy shared a room, you know what I mean? And so he used to, he used to, he used to tease me about the fact I used to sleep talk and, it, it, you know, when, when I tried to talk to him on the pitch, he'd it, say stuff about what you're still sleep talking. Um, you know what I mean? And say you're still sleepwalking. You're sleepwalking now, you ain't out of touch. And stuff like that. So the banter would just continue. It's, and, and of course, it's, it's a laugh. It's a joke. It's fine. You know, so it was, um, for me, the best times. The best times. Being amongst England as well, once Sol, Skulls, Beckham, all those guys came into it, that, 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 the younger guys, it was like an amazing squad to be in. I was pleased to be in that squad. Ian, going back to your playing days and that all-action style and uh, a lot of talking, <laughs> like, I think Alex Ferguson said at times, you know, he felt you were very volatile. He was almost telling his players to stay away from you in case they became involved in something. When you're coming up through the game and you are playing Sunday League, is anyone trying to beat that out of you to, to stop you being like that? Or actually did all your managers realise that that was, that was how you got the best out of yourself? Now, the thing is, is coming, coming through Sunday morning... Nathan, I, I started playing Sunday morning football against the men at 15, and it was it was all banter driven. We're talking about really, um, really poor players to a certain extent. As you went up the levels, who were literally trying to hurt you. They're trying. They're telling you they're gonna. They're trying to break your legs and stuff like that. So you learn to protect yourself, and you learn the banter, and you learn how to get through it. You know what I mean? There was a lot when when we were playing. You know. Um, being a team that, you know, you know, that had a lot of volatile players in it, there was fights. Of course there were fights. But as time went by, and then I finally got into the game, uh, Nathan, Steve Koppel, when, when I, after I had my trial, my two-week trial, I remember he pulled me after about a month and he said, never change the way you play, the way you approach the game, um, and the way you see the game going in your head. There's certain places where you can try to do skills and tricks and stuff. Because when I played Sunday morning football, anywhere I ended up on the pitch, I'd try and beat somebody or try and do something um, flash just because it's about, for me, Sunday morning, it's about entertainment. Once you get into the professional ranks, you can't do stuff like that. But Steve Koppel said, do not lose your natural ability to want to express yourself. So that's why, I've, that's the way I've always been. And I, to be honest, I kept that all the way through my career. Obviously, you have to be disciplined the higher you go because you start losing the ball in certain areas. People are scoring goals. You're going to start costing the team. So you have to pick and choose your moments. But I never changed my Sunday morning uh, mentality about how I approach the game. Talking, flying into tackles. You know, it's brilliant. I loved it. So the buzz for you all the way through was the expressing yourself. It was the all-action style. It wasn't just scoring the goals. If you didn't, if you went through a game and you didn't score a goal, but some other things had gone your way, would you, would you come off the pitch happy? No. Well, you're a striker. First and foremost, you want to score. You come off the pitch if you've won and you're, you're still disappointed simply because, especially if you've had a chance, Nathan, and you've missed it. Um, you know, you're, me personally, you're a bit disappointed because you want to score because back then, if you score, you probably stay in the team. Um, but, like, you always are more happy when you have scored and obviously you've played well. But if you've, if you've scored and you've not played well, for me, it, it, I, as, as long as I scored and, and we've won, I didn't care how I played. I didn't care how I played because I'd like to think that the way I played, I was always going to give a 7 out of 10 performance at least. And if I was having one of them games where it's not going for me, I just literally just start running and working my socks off, getting the crowd going, making things happening, unsettled people. And you know what I mean? And that is how I do it. That's why I knew what I was going to give to the 
to the fans and the team every week. I knew what I was going to give. Because sometimes you go out there, it's just not happening for you. Touch is off. You're missing the chances and stuff. But then you put the work in on the other side and, you know, you, you get the credit for it. And that's where I suppose the affinity with the fans comes from. I spoke to Michael Owen recently about uh, goal scoring and his confidence and his almost delusional levels of self-confidence, as he'd say himself, whereby if he was in the warm-up and he missed every shot in the warm-up, he'd be delighted because he'd feel he got them all out of his system. Whereas if he put <laughs> everyone in the back of the net, he'd be delighted because he's never been in better form, that no matter what happened, <laughs> he was starting that match with the belief that things couldn't have gone better. W were you like that? Did you have a, a natural confidence that no matter what happened, you still felt the goals were going to come? Or were there the moments is, actually where there were, where the there were dips? Yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying, Nathan. And, and uh, to be honest, when you look at Michael and the way Michael finished, you can see that what Michael's done there, he's given no room for negativity to get in. Because if he's missing, he said, it doesn't matter because I'm going to I'm going to probably score. But, and if he's scoring, he said, well, I'm scoring, so it doesn't make no difference. I'm going to continue scoring. I needed to be scoring during training as well. And what I used to do in training was I never, ever finished like, oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, just do it like, oh. I finished as if I was playing a match on a Saturday every time I finished from training. And I used to get a thing where even if I'm walking past the ball and the goal's empty, I put the ball in the goal. So everything about what I'm doing for the whole week is about seeing the ball ending up in the back of the net. So when I'm training well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy and scoring. And then when I get to the Saturday, I'm already thinking, well, I'm training well, so why shouldn't I worry? And if I'm training badly, and I'm not scoring in training, I'll say, well, it's no problem because I know that if I get the chance on Saturday, I'll take it. So you, you, you're, as a striker, you're giving yourself no room for negativity because that's when it creeps in, start seeing people getting on this four and five and six and seven, eight game where they haven't scored. That's not, I, I, that, that's not happening for players like, like Michael Owen, Robbie Fowler and things like that. I'd like to put myself in that bracket, but I'd be having myself too much. But the fact is, is that I never felt like, I wasn't going to score in any game. Saul, you went up against so many incredible strikers and played alongside them, whether it was Thierry Henry, Ronaldo, both Ronaldos you would have played against during your career. Is that something you would have noticed from marking those type of players, that no matter what happened, the head never dropped? Or did you feel at times you could get some sort of mental advantage on some of those great players? Um, the main thing is, we've, we've really, you know, right is in that, you know, guys who could get a chance and half a chance, quarter of a chance, boom, it's in the goal. Do you know what I mean? So the higher you go up and you and you, if you want to, you know, get in as a as a young lad in football, because back then I started 18, 19, to get back, get into this football side, professional, you know, side back then as an 18, there was only a few guys doing it. It was probably me, there was Giggsy around. Um, I think uh, Bex came a little bit after, the Man Night and the guy came a little bit after, but it was quite rare for a youngster to come in. So you had to learn really quickly because when you came up against these guys, you couldn't afford to have give them too much space or give them an inch or a, a ricochet or bad clearance and it just lands to their feet in the box and they just say, thank you very much, you know, inexperienced lad, boom, goal, one nil, thank you very much. So you had to kind of limit the, the, the mistakes, the, the, the positioning for them in and around the box because they could just come along, half chance, bang, swivel, you know, look around. And also they're anticipating, you know, little bubbles of the keeper, you know, or hit the post and I'm there. So you had to, for, for, the, for the forward, they have to, they're, they're gambling. That's them that love to gamble. So you have to say, I have to think like a forward. I have to think, okay, it's going in, it's going wide, but it looks like it hit the post. I've got to come in because I know there's a clever forward coming in, sniffing around. So, do you know what? He might, he might do a bad save. He might hit his head. He might bounce. He might do a look rook shot. I'm going to be in position. So you had to kind of cover two, three runs as a defender because the gamble, uh, a real good forward just gambles in and, in and goes. If he gets lucky, he gets lucky. If he doesn't, he doesn't. But for me... The one time, the one time I don't go back in, if it hits, the, you know, come off the keeper, little ricochet, keeper doesn't hold it or hits the bar or whatever, bang, in. So you had to kind of cover it. That's the thing with guys of that level, you know, Wrighty, there's Michael Owen, there's Shearer, all these kind of guys, you know, Thierry, you can, the list goes on and on. You know, you, you had to watch them 90 odd minutes. You had to. He had to. You just couldn't. Let, even if they're having a bad game, thinking, you know, they might just get one chance, you know what I mean? So you had to really make sure, even if they, once the whistle's gone, then right, the game's over. But those guys, the game's never over them. 
are you coming off the pitch mentally exhausted then in those type of matches where you're having to concentrate for so long? Where there, there is no, no switch actually, off. For me, I love concentrating. It was it was a breeze for me. The, the harder the game, the more right on the game, the more I wanted it. You know, it was just like it was food and drink for me. So what I'm saying is, I had to concentrate. It didn't it didn't tax me. I just loved it. You know, you just can't you just can't take liberties with these guys. <laughs> What, what happened then on 16th of August, 1993? I picked that up because it was the one that came up on Google when I was searching North London derbies that you played against each other. Nil-nil, 86 minutes. It might have even been your first ever North London derby, Saul, was it? And Ian Wright oh, pops Rice, up. Was it Hedda? Was it Hedda? He pops up. Yeah. Pops up. Did all and those things you've just like spoken about. Pitch. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The whole pitch, did he? It, it sounds like a typical Ian Wright performance. He got booked after three minutes and scored the winner after 86 minutes. You know, yeah. you know the thing with that one? I remember it as well because, like I say, with that, one of them games, especially when you played at White Hart Lane, which for me was the best start, the best. I, I enjoyed the derbies over there better. I had a lot of joy there, but that was one of those games, again, where Seoul literally, I was literally in his pocket for the, the whole game. I was trying to make runs on everybody else. It just wasn't happening for me. And I remember it. I, can, I remember it plainly. Eddie McGoldrick took the corner. Andy Linegan bounced up. And I started on the goalkeeper. I think Sol might have been on the post. So I started between... What you do, Nathan? You put yourself on Sol, who's marking the post. And so the other guys, when they look around before the corner's taken, they look and they say, oh, he's taken. So if so, don't say to one of them, oi, someone take him, I'm doing the post, then they think you're being marked by Sol. So when, when the ball comes across and it, I come off of Sol, Sol obviously has to stay on the post, and so you, you're, you're in the middle three. So you're gambling, like Sol just said, on the ball coming there. And the ball come there, Andy Linnigan, brilliant header, bam, I just edited it in. It was just, like Sol said, I ran <laughs> all the way back to Dave Seaman. <laughs> and I teased all the Tottenham fans on the way because you could see them trying to run down to get me. <laughs> I tried to run down to get me because I was going, ah, laughing at them. Because I knew the game was over. If we scored, there's no way they're going to score again because of Tony and the boys. And so I ran to Dave Seaman. It was, I, ca I cannot tell you how great that day was. I've done it a couple of times at White Hart Lane, right at the death. But that one for me, Nathan, was, even now, it makes me smile. So, I actually so, have to so, say still isn't fans, smiling. When they see me, Nathan, when the Tottenham fans now, they see me and they, 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 they tell me, oh, yeah, yeah, they say, I said, whoa, I can't hurt you no more. I've hurt yeah. you in the past. I can't hurt you no more. It's over. Get over it. <laughs> the more you read about your career, Ian, like, it is such a fairy tale in ways that like, you've got to remind yourself, you went to Arsenal and you're 28. When you're going into that dressing room, like that's an Arsenal team, all right, <laughs> they're champions, but they're an Arsenal team with a, a reputation who... Play hard and party hard as well. Yeah. Had you any concerns at all about the... I'm sure you were looking forward to the footballing side and the talents of the players that were there. Had you any concerns about being dragged into the other stuff? No, because like I wasn't that way inclined. You had to go and bond. It was a bonding session. It was a time um, in English football where you see the success that that team had before I got there. They were champions twice out of three years before I got there. And what they'd done in respect of their bonding sessions is something that was probably part of helping that. Now, I'm not saying that um, that's the way everybody should go, but it was something in the makeup of Arsenal in and around that time that seemed to, to help with what they were doing. Now, there was no one who went to the Tuesday Club, it's no secret what it was called, and was forced to have to get involved in the, in the drinking and everything that went with the culture around that time. You know what I mean? It was especially like me. I used to be with, obviously, I spent a lot of time with David Rollcastle. We'd go. We'd have a couple of drinks and talk about what we talk about, and then you, you leave. It's, it's, it's just, just the way it went. But what we found as time went by, and once Tony, obviously, we got to Arsene Wenger and everything like that, is that once Tony sorted himself out, you know, it was fine. We, we, we stopped doing it, and we saw with, when we went with Arsenal, um, with Arsenal, with Arsene Wenger, how you moved forward with a different attitude towards that. You don't need to be doing that, but at the time, it was fun to be around the guys because it was part of what we'd done. It was part of the bonding and the camaraderie session. And it's a place where you ended up sorting differences out on the training ground. Remember, you're with people for nine months of the year. Things happen. People fall out. And it's a place where you can sort those kind of things out. But when I went into that dressing room, it was in a magnificent atmosphere. Winners. Winners. That's all I, that's all I remember about them. Winners. It... it 
clearly was a different generation. And it is when you read back and you hear about these insane eating competitions on these long bus trips back from from Newcastle. Like, is, was there any part of you thinking, this isn't totally professional? Or were you all thinking, actually, everybody else is doing this, so it's just fine? No, because remember, everybody's grown men. And, you know, when you get a load of men together, of course, people do things and do play silly games and stuff like that. But what it comes down to, me is the fact that it, it, it was all leading towards doing the best you can on the pitch. You have to have fun. And we had a lot of fun. We had the card stalls. We had the eating competitions. We've done everything. But what, what it all was culminating towards and, and moving towards was performing to the best of your ability once you played on a Saturday. And I believe that for the most of our career, especially when I was at Arsenal, everybody did that. No matter what was going on behind the scenes, everybody were, was, was professional and brilliant about the way they approached the game. So you said there, you know, you came from nothing, but clearly there was something that separated you from others because football is a wasteland of people who had talent and just couldn't capitalise on it. Like, you're in your early 20s, as you say, you're starting to make a few quid, the Premier League has arrived. It would have been very easy to lose the run of yourself. There was clearly something there from your upbringing that meant actually you had a very good head in your shoulders. I think that's from my mum and father. My dad was really, you know, strong. My mother had lots of love. They, they worked every... Every, you know, hour, every minute, God sent, you know, one was working on the trains, the other one was working in the uh, in the cable factory. I'm from East London, you know, got to look after self. Brothers, you know, brothers are brothers, you know, um, you know, nine, nine people in one in one house. So it wasn't it wasn't easy. So but then I saw my family and some of my brothers and how they were kind of acting and, and see how easy you could kind of be distracted um if you weren't focused enough and i i said once i got my opportunity you know to, to go to I, I got it through to uh, uh Lidishaw, the english um, you know fa national school of excellence you know 14 to 16 two years started focusing a little bit more once when i came back to back to spurs i, I couldn't waste my time yeah i had a nice time maybe on a saturday after the game things like that but i was still thinking about the game i was just thinking about the game i just loved the game i was thinking about the game all the time but i could not waste. I had no time to waste because what I saw in front of me, I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to have a fantastic opportunity and just throw it away. I'm not that type of mentality. My mum, you know, brought me up in a totally different way. Yes, it's not, you know, all my family maybe don't think like me, but that's how I think. Yeah. And that's how I carry on. And, I, and that's how I will carry on because it will last through until, you know, eternity in my life. I won't lose that type of mentality because you need that mentality going forward anyway now. So I'm glad I've had that. You know, it got me through football, but then now it'll get me through management and things like that. I will keep that attitude, that fire in my belly, that kind of, you know, now so, you know, working out things, being clever, seeing things that people don't other people don't see. And, and when you're in these, from these areas, you've got to be quick. You, if you snooze, you lose. You've got to be understanding what's around you. You've got to be very clever. Maybe you haven't got to Oxford and Cambridge, but um, life skills and, and understanding football, very switched on. Because I had to. I'm not going to lose that. My mind is obviously, my body is different because obviously, you know, you, 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 I'm not a 25-year-old. But your mind, my mind is fresh and ready to kind of mm. crack on. So now I'm using my mind and, and my experience. But you don't lose that. All those kind of things came from when I was growing up from, you know, East London, Plasto, Stratford. I'll never lose it because that will keep me in good stead going forward. And that's, that's how I am. Yeah, and it's brilliant to hear that you still have such passion uh, for the game and for every part of your life. Uh, Ian, just before we move on to when Arsene Wenger arrives, how do you reflect then on those first few years at Arsenal where listen, you start in such unbelievable fashion, you know, hat-trick in your first league game, you end the season as top scorer, uh, apparently, because it was pre-Premier League, so I'm not sure if it actually exists in the record books, but you were the Premier League's golden boot winner, or the league's golden boot winner in the year before the Premier League started. You're Arsenal's top scorer for six seasons but you don't win the league in a team that had just won it two of the three previous seasons. Is there, is there a regret that you weren't more successful and do you feel you could have done anything different to actually have had some success? In, in what respect? In, in, terms, in, ter or, in terms of winning, winning a league. Three. No, just, just in the pre, in the sort of four or five years. No, no because when I, when I came and, um, and, and finished the season like I did, um, you know, playing with my dear friend, David Rokas and Michael Thomas and Paul Davison, Paul Merson, and, you know, it was, a, it was a great team to play in, Kevin Campbell. Um, but one of, the, one of the main things for me about being in that team and why I was so happy to be there and, 
even though we didn't win anything off of the back of that um, that season, it was it was like for me my, one of my best seasons ever, easily, in the league was because I was playing with David Roncastle. So I was thinking that yes, like I said, we just won the league twice in the last three years or four years after that season, and I'm thinking yes, yeah, the, the success and that again is only around the corner. But I didn't know that we were going to go through a fallow uh, some fallow years, but. I was always starting the next season thinking, yeah, this is going to be the one, this is going to be the one. It was... I, th the best thing that's happened to me in, in my life, it's easily signing for Arsenal Football Club simply because of how great they were, what they meant to me from um, a young age, because David Rocastle went there when he was a youth team player at the age of, like, 15, 16, and then we on the estate, on Roca Estate, everybody, 1982, 83, we, everybody started to support Arsenal. And that's where it came from. So I was just glad to be there, Nathan. And to end up scoring those goals like I did, I think it was 29 league goals. I scored five for Palace before, um, before I went. I was just thinking, my God, this is amazing, playing with really good players. And you're always told that when you get to the next level of player, the game becomes a bit easier. You have to then work on making the runs because great players will find you. I found that at Arsenal. One of the, most, one of the, one of the best players, I thought, Obviously, David Rowcastle was magnificent. Michael Thomas, but Paul Merson was an unbelievable player to play with. And as Limpa, unbelievable chances they created for you. And I was quite excited, Nathan, simply because I knew that the next season, like you mentioned, six seasons I was a top goal scorer, I'm going to get chances made for me. So I'm always feeling that the good times are, are around the corner for me. So I was always very positive and hoping that things are going to happen. Talk a bit more about Merson there and, and just how good he was. Well, to be honest, um, you know, when they say, like I say, people talk about, um, yeah, you'll play with quality players, players that will be able to hurt you. Um, when you, If you leave, when you leave Crystal Palace and you go somewhere like an Arsenal and this and that, and why so often Paul Merson in training, what he could do with his right foot is like everything. You know what I mean? His left foot literally was for standing on. He could find you wherever the ball would be, if it was trapped under his feet, as long as he could get his right foot back in any way, he will be able to manipulate the ball towards you. He was magnificent. The way he finished, he had great energy. I remember before I got there, him and Alan Smith's work rate to close defenders down was off the charts. Um, so we're talking about somebody who could literally do everything. He could have played in midfield. He could play any, anywhere up front. He was an unbelievable player, remarkable player. The turning point then in to the more modern Arsenal Obviously, Wenger is the obvious touch point. But is it the arrival of Wenger or is it the arrival of Dennis Bergkamp that sparked the change for you? Dennis Bergkamp. Um, because he came before him for, for a start. <laughs> but I think that when, um, when you look at that signing and when you feel... I, I, remember, what, I, I remember telling people about um, when you watch the film, when you watch a Spider-Man film, every time Peter Parker gets bitten by that spider, you see the DNA go through the film and you see it change and all clink up and do that. That's what happened when Dennis signed for Arsenal because when he signed, the whole of the Arsenal's DNA changed and it's no coincidence that from 95 when he started moving on, the success came. Um, I think um, it was brilliant and it coincided with Arsene Wenger coming in with his philosophies towards the game and his approach towards the game, making Dennis the player that's going to be the, the integral point of Arsenal moving forward was like a match made in heaven. You know, when, um, when Arsene Wenger finally did come, revolutionised the club, literally changed in a week. From one week you were doing stuff like that, eating chips maybe with, um, with pies or you, all that sort of food, what you could have, anything you could have as your pre-match meal, all changed within a week. And the sooner you bought into it, the better you were going to be. And he was never, ever somebody that forced anything upon you. You could go and speak to him about, why, why are we having this? Why are we getting these tablets? What are we taking this? And he just explain it to you. What's going to happen? Why you take it? What it's going to do for you? How strong you're going to feel? And how well you're going to play? That's all he used to talk about. So, you know, Dennis Bergkamp was obviously, for me, the catalyst for everything. But then Arsene Wenger was, obviously, he finished it up. When we're talking about great strikers, Sol, and you would have played against Dennis Bergkamp on any number of occasions, a very different type of striker, was he, from some of the ones we were talking earlier, who could pounce on a chance, like, you know, he'd drift deep, he'd get involved in the games, he could create from anywhere. How difficult was he to go up against? You know, with, uh, 
with Dennis, I think um, what a remarkable player. I, I think, you know, his time in Italy probably um, were Arsenal fans were probably thinking, glad he didn't have a good time in Italy because that's how, you know, they <laughs> yeah, if, he, if he kicked on, he probably would have left Italy to come to uh, London Arsenal. So for me, people don't realise, you know, oh, you know, incredibly quick. He was a quick, strong, uh, fantastic uh, feat. He had a he had a bit of a, look, you know, him and Wrighty, God, you know, if if he wanted to put his foot in, you know, Iceman would put his foot in, do you know what I mean? <laughs> so he had that grit, that nastiness from, you know, back, you know, back, street, back streets of uh, Amsterdam, um, but very clever. You know, he had everything. And he, he could, you know, even when I got there back, he was, you know, plus 30. He was still doing things, still strong, still quick, still can think quicker than some of the new forwards coming in. You know, it's unbelievable. I mean, for me, you know, I just wish if he could, um, if we had him more flying away games, I think Arsenal would have won the European Cup by now. I think some certain games, that quality, that unbelievable quality, were the extra bit that we needed were missing in some games. Uh, and um, because he couldn't get to some of the away games, some of the, you know, the quarterfinals or you know, things like that. So I, I felt if he was you know, able to travel, I think Arsenal would have won the European Cup by now. Was that ever because... anything you spoke from about? No. No. But I think it, it that, just you know, that quality, having that, oh, what, right or me? I either. No, I'm just saying so. Once you said no, I wanted to say no as well because because people thought that when, when Dennis didn't fly, we just, once we realised that, okay, he doesn't fly, fine, he doesn't fly. And, you know, people, people was like, so say, people, like, you get some fans, if we missed, if we lost the game by the odd goal or this and that, they might say, oh, if Dennis was playing. But Dennis didn't fly, and we expect, we, we, we accepted that. He used to drive, Dennis used to drive with the kit man, Vic Ackers, anywhere where the club wanted him to go. He'd leave a couple of days before, yeah. and he would drive. We'd get there, Dennis would be in the hotel. So it's not like he wouldn't try. Anywhere in Europe, Dennis would get there with the, with the kit man. That's why him and the kit man had such a, a great relationship, because they spent a lot of time together in the car, driving to wherever we needed to go. So it's not like, oh, you know, Dennis didn't, he didn't try. He tried to get there, and he would get there. And sometimes Arsene Wenger said, no, leave it, home leg. For me, Ian, when I think of the Arsene Wenger era, you were very much synonymous with it. And it's still strange to think you only played with him for a couple of years. And during one of those seasons, you had a bad injury as well. Obviously, the title, first title winning season, you, you missed a good chunk of that season. But I think it's because of both the warmth that you talk about him and that he talks about you. Was it? Did you just click straight away? With, with, the, with the boss? Yeah. Oh, are you talk, we're talking about Arsene or Dennis? Arsene. You, you and Arsene. Oh. You know what I? You know what is really weird because with with the boss, it, sometimes I catch him just looking at me. Because <laughs> I remember he, he he used to say to people um, when he found out about my story and how I got through and how old I was, I, I used to just he, he couldn't believe it. And when we used to speak, he used to say, "I can't believe it. where did you find this footballing uh, intelligence from? With the way you moved, the way you finished, your your you know your, being a killer." In front of goal, he used to say, "Where did?" And sometimes I used to just catch him looking at me. Um, I think he was fascinated with me because I was doing crazy things. I remember he caught me, he caught me um, on the rollerblades in the car park, and then when he told me not to do that, and I said, "Yeah, no problem." And then he caught me again, and I was got, he, I, I got to the ground early, and um, I was I was rollerblading through the marble hall, and he caught me again, um, but for some reason. I don't know if he, obviously, in his mind, he knew that I'm not going to be there for much, much longer. But, like, he was always just just really good with me. He always treated me very well. And he, he was very honest with me all the time. It was very refreshing to have somebody that wasn't screaming at you, even when you know you're playing well. You know, you've got a manager coming in. Because you're playing well, you might have nicked a couple of goals, screaming at you because he wants to keep your, your feet on the ground. It's rubbish. Arsene Wenger will come in and say, you can score more. You're playing so well. Keep going. How many can you score? How well can you play? Set yourself tight. That kind of stuff. It's, it's much better. It's like a father. You go and you think you're sitting there at half time, Nathan, thinking, I just, I just want to get back out there to, to do it for him. 
And he saw how hard I worked for him. He saw how hard I worked in training, especially at my age, because when he came in, he sent me away to France with a guy called Timios Darrow, who was a, a specialist trainer, He's trained you up for like a week, two weeks, and sent you back and you're ready to go because he wanted me to be the best I can be. And I remember, like Sol said at the start, you know, um, he, 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 he elongated your career. My career was, he made it, he, he gave me extra years, three extra years, just by being with him for two and a half years. Do you still rollerblade? <laughs> I don't rollerblade no more. Far too, I was too old for it then, and I'm too old, I'm even older for it now, Nathan. You can still get away with it, I'm sure. Is it true he... I wouldn't get away with it. He, he used I've got a skateboard now. I've got an electric skateboard. An, el an electric skateboard. Wow, I'd like to see one of those. Yeah, well, you have to hold it like that, and then you could go... Yeah. <laughs> but I don't, I don't use that too often. My missus won't let me go on it. Is it true he used to put on training later because you used to always turn up late for training, so instead of having to find <laughs> you, he actually just pu pushed it on? No, and let me let me just explain it. It's funny because I think that they got that from Tony Adams, and the thing with Tony... I had to speak to Tony about that because I've uh, I heard that interview. Somebody told me about it. And I had to redress that balance simply because no, and you, you, you can ask, so, no football manager or team is going to change training because a professional footballer is coming to training late. It was Tony. I spoke to Tony. He said, oh, you know, I was speaking. It got a bit laddish. I uh, kind of got a bit carried away. You know, I had to come from Junction 6 on the M25 to Junction 22. And if I was late more than twice, I might be over-exaggerating. And if we're talking about late, we're talking about literally r running out onto the training ground when the guys are going out there. And I'm running out and they might be there. I'm never late. So it, I, I find that that one's, for me, very hard to take simply because I prided myself on being there and being professional. So like I say, Tony, the, the club would never have accepted that. And like I say, I spoke to the skipper and I said, Skip, when you're doing your stuff and you're getting a little bit over-exuberant and getting laddish, try not to throw me under the bus like that because it didn't happen, Nathan. I was not late because it would not be... At Arsenal football... At Arsenal? Can you imagine? George Graham? God, come on. You know what I mean? Yeah. You must still be incredibly proud of what you achieved and being the club's all-time record scorer for so many years until Thierry on re-arrived, especially getting to the club at, at such a young age. Like, it's, it's such a defining part of your life, being that Arsenal legend now. Well, to be honest, it's, um, like I say, um, it's, it's a privilege to be involved in that football club. And, you know, to go there, I would never have thought that would have happened, Nathan, um, scoring the goals I did to get to, to get to the record because I just simply wanted to go somewhere where I was able to win things, and like so, so rightly said, you want to make a change with the, with the opportunity you get when you come from where you've come from. You want to you want to put down a marker so as people know, yes, I was here. And so I think Sol's definitely done that, and I like to think that I've done that, and it's, it's a lot of hard work that gets that, get, get you there. So I'm so, I'm so proud to have, for the time I was the, the record goal scorer, it was magnificent for me. You only realise it, that you've, you've achieved something like that when it's gone. But, like, it's there for everyone to see, and I'm pleased that um, it happened for me. I'm pleased that it happened for me. And um, I, I, I have no problem with where I am in the Arsenal's history books now because I couldn't do any more. Couldn't do any more. Mm. That photo is iconic when you lift the jersey and it's 179, just done it. Yeah. W was, yeah. was that a nice little earner from Nike? Did you make the most of that? No, actually. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> what? No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't a nice earner because obviously being an athlete for them, um, you know what I mean? It was just something that they they jumped on simply because it was an opportunity. You know, their slogan was just do it. So we changed it to, to just done it. And so, you know what I mean? It was something that was just done. After a few games, bam, it was done. But like, no, there wasn't no extra cash involved in that. It was just a... Like you say, it was an iconic uh, picture now. Yeah, it certainly was. Uh, Saul, for you and, and Arsene Wenger, how early in the negotiations when you were going to leave Tottenham was Arsene Wenger involved? Oh, uh, it was late on. It was late on. It was all done very late. Um, it's such a long time ago. Uh, but, um, you know, I had a walk, few walks around uh, David Dean's garden. But uh, <laughs> it was a late, it was a it was a late show. Um, I was I actually was going to Italy, uh, and then a Spanish club came in, but it was late on. 
it seems from the way you've been talking there about your attitude at Tottenham and Arsene Wenger's attitude to football that it was a match made in heaven. Well, it was it was awesome, but also it was the players as well at the time. It's the players, you know. Um, a manager can get you in, but if there's no players there, it doesn't matter if you're a really good manager. You're thinking, well, it, you know, I, I need to share the load. You know, you need the top players around you to to be able to do something, you know, in, in the league or win whatever or, or qualify for something. So it, it's the players. I mean, I came in, you know, there was uh, actually it was Tony. It was Tony last year. There was there was there was um, uh, Link Dixon, you know, there as well. Mike Keown, you know, David Seaman. But then you had the new generation of Patrick Vieira, Thierry, um, Lundberg was in there. Uh, Perez. The quality uh, of the Ray training Parler. sessions Everyone must have been forget, insane. You know, forgets about Ray Parler. Mm. You know, that Canu. You know, the list goes on. That the, the top players that were that were there and, and then came in, but. You know, that was fantastic. You know, Ashley Cole coming through the ranks, um, Laurent as well. So, you know, it was fantastic. So it's really, you got the Wiltard as well. You know, the list, the list goes on. It's the players. You know, yes, the manager's there, but you need the players as well to say, you know what, where can you, you know, slot in and, and um, improve this team and kick it on as well? That's what you want to do, you know, because you want to you go to somewhere and make the difference and improve that side, and that's what hopefully I've done. I, I, I've done that, and but you know you got all all those players. Dennis Burkamp, you need those players to make it happen, facilitate it. If you haven't go in, if I went in there and maybe there's only four or five of them there, that's not enough to win anything. It's not enough. It's not enough. You need the complete package. What was your first training session like when you went in and all those players are there and? They know where you've come from. They've been up against you for so many years. What sort of welcome a, was it? it? It took a long time because I came injured. <laughs> 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 and it was, I think one of my first games were against um, Roma in Austria pre-season. So that was my first game I came on. So it took a long time for me to actually um, get going and get fit and things like that. But, um, you know, for me, it was just finding my feet uh, getting used to the club, obviously, you know, you had Tony and Martin, uh, you know, they, they were, you know, the stable kind of guys at Arsenal, the back, back four. Um, so I had to kind of wait, wait for my time and, uh, you know, start improving. And uh, I slowly, slowly, you know, got into the side. But for me, anything that, that is worth kind of, you know, possessing it, it is worth waiting for. And I had to be patient, get fit and then wait for my kind of moments to kind of shine. Thierry Henry has said one of the reasons he went to Arsenal was because Ian Wright was uh, such a hero for him. Did he act like Ian Wright in any ways? Was he was he quite mouthy <laughs> at times like Ian Wright, or was he a, a very different personality? No, he's mouthy in a French way because you just you could shut him up. You know, Thierry just loves talking, just talking, talking in his five languages as well. So, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it was obviously it's a centre forward. You know, it's uh, you know he's the you know the, the main man and. Obviously, that's rightly so. So, you know, there is similarities in there, but um, all forwards want to show off in their own way. That's just normal. Mm. That era and the success, so much of it is remembered from those iconic games against Manchester United and the unbeaten record and the tunnel. And you're a part of so many of those games and watching them back over, over the last few weeks, like, Jesus, it's bloody exhilarating to even watch them now. The, the hair is on the back of your necks. What was it like for you to be in the middle of them? Did, were those games different? Were you different around those games? Or did you manage to just stay in your level all the time? What, just on that like, against teams like Man United? Or against just against Manchester season, United and that particular rivalry with United? Um, do you know what? I think it was healthy for football, I think. You know, to have, you know, two going, you know, toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Um, it's nice to have that, but it was two going toe-to-toe -to -toe very early on. And uh, but But I felt... You know, you 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 couldn't you couldn't slip up. You know, you start if you lost, say two three games. I mean, honestly, I think at one stage if you lost five games, that was it. You just four or five games, you couldn't win. You couldn't win because the other team was just like, thank you very much. That's that's what we need, and they just kind of go ahead and they they wouldn't let it slip. So you had to go toe to toe, and you know, one point, three points here and there. You know, you you couldn't stretch it to five, seven, ten, fifteen. You know, no chance. You had to kind of, you know, stay in the game. 
Mm. Um, and that's, you know, that, that, that brings pressure, you know, internal pressure, individual pressure, team pressure. But if you've got enough guys who, who love that pressure and sometimes even need that pressure, uh, it's even better because you know you're always going to be wired. You're always going to be up for it. You're not going to miss a trick. You're going to be on it. You're going to look after yourself because you know the opposition, they're looking after themselves as well. Yes, they might be having a good time every now and again, but, you know, most of the time they're on it and they're waiting for someone to slip up. And you don't want, you don't want to be the one slipping up and you slip up for two, three games and then they just pull away and then they find that little gap and they never, 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 never allow you to close that gap again. So uh, it can happen sometimes, you know. Those, but, ga um, those games, the, they get really tasty. Is very important. Mm. You know, the last 10, 12 games can be very important. But um, if you let it slip, you know, they, they might be saying, what, last six games? They won it the last six games. So you always have to get that mentality. Stay in, stay in the game. Everybody up for it. No one letting it slip. And uh, it, it was healthy for football. I think it's healthy for football, for sure, at the time. They did get very tasty, those matches. I, I don't think you played in the nil-nil where Van Nistelrooy misses the penalty and Martin Keown is shouting in his face. But the match where you lose the 49-game record and... Well, since we're in the company where I would say Wayne Rooney dived and uh, the Pizza Gate straight <laughs> after I just that. wish, I just wish VAR was around <laughs> because referees are more cuter. They understand, they see, they more, they know what's going on. That would have been, you know, it, but, but it was a time when you probably you probably could get away with it, and it, 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 it happened. But now that would be picked up straight away. United players felt that maybe you were bad losers with that. That even you know you couldn't accept this. Because of the rivalry, you couldn't admit that United were a better team. That that even though it did end and it had to end, that for some reason the Arsenal players just wouldn't accept it. W would you look back and say, actually, yeah, we were well, bad yeah, losers? Because, because of, you know how they got the first penalty, things like that. It, it, it's yeah. normal. I think th it would yeah. be picked up now. It would be picked up now. There is no penalty. But back then it was, it is what it is. Referees weren't sharp enough, and uh, you know they were thinking everyone's so honest and things like that. And you know if you had if we had the uh, VAR, that would have been picked up all day long. The thing with it's that Nathan, is. yeah, but the thing with that Nathan is, is that um, you, I, I would be if I was in in that dressing room, I'd be absolutely gutted about that because you don't mind losing it, but you don't want it to be in that way, because that, that, that you just don't want it to be in that way. And of course, I'm I'm with Sol. You don't want to you don't want to lose it to Man United because they're not going to let you forget. But that wasn't like Arsenal being bad losers because they were beaten fair and square, you know. So it's an easy one to take that one. Obviously, the memorable moment is Roy Keane and Patrick Vieira going head-to-head. -head. Ian, when you were given centre-backs jip, did you ever give Roy Keane some jip when you were players? Me and Roy Keane always argued when we was on the pitch. We always were spitting at each other in respect of words and saying stuff and, and things like that. You know what I mean? And the, the thing is, is that um, when, you, when you're doing it as well, even at the time, you knew. Because I remember when Roy Keane signed for United, from Forest, we had me and Roy Keane had some run-ins when he was at Forest. But when he when he signed for United, I remember we played them um, in South Africa. We played Man United. I think we beat them. Scored a couple of penalties. We beat Man United. And I remember in the tunnel, I remember saying, "All the best to your United career." I said, "Yeah, cheers." And we was always like that. But like when we was on the pitch, you know, if if I didn't have Tony Adams as a captain and a leader, I'd probably want someone like Roy Keane as a captain and leader, especially now. I know him. We talk about football all the time, talk about the days. You know what I mean? He's the kind of character that's it's about winning, man. It's, it's all winning. And whatever it takes in respect of you as a professional to get yourself in a situation and a position to make sure that you win is the only thing that he's going to accept. He's not going to accept anything less than that. He's my friend. You know what's really good about it is that the way we went at each other then, when you see now, to, to be able to call him my friend now, you know what I mean? I know. You know what I mean? We talk about all sorts of stuff. You know, and now it's I, I, that makes me feel good, and that's this is great about the game. Saul, for you and and that United team, was there a was there a respect, even a, a grudging respect of maybe you were two alike? Maybe that why there was such a rivalry, that there was such a desperation to win, that it was Vieira on one side, it was Keane on the other side, that you saw something of yourselves in them. No, I you know I. I know quite a few of the uh, Man United guys from early on England, um, you know, under 16, under 17, under 18. So I had a lot, I had quite a lot of friends actually in Man United uh, playing in the team. And so, so for me, there is that professional rival, that rivals, 
you know, I think that's it's healthy. You know, you keep everyone, as I said before, it keeps you on your toes. You want to kind of, you know, you want to get one over them and things like that. But you, you have to appreciate the skill they had, and they were probably doing the same uh, as uh, uh, same to us, you know, whilst we were playing at uh, Arsenal. So it was like, you know, it, it's not like a standoff, but, you know, you have to appreciate and, uh, uh, and recognise the quality they had. And I'm sure deep down they were saying, they'll be saying, yeah, they recognised the quality we had. It was just slightly done in a different way, you know, but we still kind of ended up with the same kind of, OK, <laughs> they obviously won a lot more uh, <laughs> Premier Leagues, uh, you know, but we, at the time, it was it was fantastic toe-to-toe. And we professionally were at each other but at the same time, professionally, kind of, you know, appreciating uh, appreciating the other side and their qualities of, of of football ability. Ian, you seem to really enjoy the uh, dynamic when yourself and Roy will be on television together, whether it's at World Cups or covering European Championships, and uh, you, you seem to play off each other quite well. Well, the thing is, it's not even a case of you playing off each other. Roy says what he says, <laughs> and then you either disagree with it or you agree with it. But if you disagree, and that, then you know that you're you're going into an area where you don't know what's coming next. And what I love about it is that I'm I'm never far away from, from bursting out and laughing because, and he's not neither. You know, of course he's a serious guy and he always says to me before we go on, right, he, don't give me none of that banter bollocks, man. I'm here to talk <laughs> serious football. And so, you know what I mean? I also, I'm already getting ready to, to laugh and smile with him. But like, he never says anything on there for effect. He never says anything when he's talking about football for effect. When he says something, I remember a little bit, a little while back, um, he said something about David De Gea mm. and Harry Maguire. He meant that. So I think that people get confused with, oh, him saying something like that, and, oh, he said... He meant that. So you, when, when you know Roy Keane, you take that for what it is, because he probably would be swinging. <laughs> he probably is swinging. But for me and Roy now, honestly, it's just like... When they say, yeah, right, yeah, right it's you and Roy Keane, instantly excited, because... We, we, we have a great day, and then we go on the box, and he'll be talking normally, but he literally goes, and he literally turns it to another person. As soon as the music for the intro is finished, he's, and it's not like he's switching something, it's just that's what he is. I'm, not, I'm here to speak about football, I'm serious. I'm here to talk serious stuff, and I will tell you exactly what I, I'm telling you, and I mean exactly what I'm telling you. I've never, I don't have as much fun on the television, like obviously Sheer and Lydica, magnificent. But when I'm on with Roy, I can feel my butterflies. But there's butterflies in my stomach because you don't know what's coming. He's made no secret, Ian, that he'd love to get back into management. Like, when you talk about that David De Gea moment and Harry Maguire moment and, like, it sets the internet alight and it gets people talking for days and whether it's an acceptable way to speak about modern-day footballers, do you think, ultimately, it's harming his chances of getting back into the game? Um, you have to say um, that there'll be people who'll be worried about that kind of comment but if you take the comment for what it was he said if he was there if he was one of their teammates if he was with them he'd be swinging he's not one of their teammates he's not saying that if i was a manager and i went in there i'd be swinging so for people to be saying oh i'm gonna stay away from roy Keane because what he's gonna he's gonna hit players it's rubbish he was talking about them as his teammates when he was playing i remember talking about roy Keane and the way roy Keane captain the great Man United science. That's what you probably have to go in there and do to get those guys to focus on what they're doing. So for people to look at Roy Keane and say they're not going to take him because of what he might say as a pundit is ludicrous. It's ridiculous. You know, he's got a lot to offer. You only need to sit, you know, you need to sit down and speak to him. He'll tell you about a left back in the in the second division and how good he is, what his strengths are, what his weaknesses are. You know, it's just that we're in a time now where People are just like, you know, they'd rather regurgitate the same managers and say, let me go and get him and see, you know, he's looking for a chance back in. Let me put him back in. Let me put him back in. If I was the owner of a club, I'd have Roy Keane in it. Absolutely, I'd have Roy Keane in it all day long. Because I know that the players are going to respond to him. And you, you, you give him the right pieces with all the, um, the, the data that you can get now. And, of course, it would still probably anger him. Somebody coming from outside, like the from the, the, the fitness team, telling him who he can pick and who he can't pick. But those are the things that I know that he'll, be, he'll get used to. How are you not going to have a player like that, a, a manager like that, who's, who's had the career he's had, who's had the career he's had, and not try and tap into that to help your team? 
They're missing a trick. All of them who's not taking them, missing a trick. Yeah, it'll be interesting uh, when he eventually does end up getting another job. This is the second of the year's OTB Sports Remote Road Shows in partnership with Cadbury FC. If you missed the first one with Shay Given and Packy Bonner, you can get that on all our social channels now. And make sure you check out cadburyfc.com for updates on promotions and giveaways. Across the last few days, we have been asking our listeners and our viewers to send in your questions for Ian and Saul. We put some of these to the lads over the next few minutes. Everybody who entered and got a question asked, you've won yourself a Cadbury hamper. So well done wow. to you. Well done. <laughs> Though I won't lie, it's not been without controversy. They were sent into the office last week and somebody, <laughs> somebody ate one of them. So we're down one. I'm not even lying about this. So we got to go back and uh, we will get you all a hamper. <laughs> While we're talking about management, uh, Gar Tuhi asks Ian, why haven't you ever got into coaching and management? You know, the thing is, um, is that when I was finishing, Gareth, um, and I'm going to speak directly to him now, is I had a management team that were pushing me more towards light entertainment. And the thing is, I will always, and I cannot blame anybody but myself. I should have been stronger. I had the time to say, listen, I'll do this for two years. Let me do the badges, and then I'll do it. But I had the kind of management that um, I had ITV, BBC, all of them wanted me to do these chat show things, what I was doing. And I got caught up in the hedonistic vibe of the whole thing, the, the entertainment world, and um, what I was going to be, what the next bloody Michael Parkinson or whatever it is. And um, I regret that. I regret it because every management, and I look at myself, and a lot of people who are managers, people say, geez, when he's in the dressing room, I've never seen him as a manager. And it's something that I'm going to have to take with me. And it's only the, the only regret having football, is that I didn't do the badges to give myself the opportunity to be a manager. And if you fail, you fail, but I didn't do that. And so it's a regret I have because I'm not afraid of that. I'm not afraid of doing it. Um, but, like, it, it was too late for me to take the badges and take the time to do it now. So it's something that I'm going to have to take to the grave, Gareth, that I didn't have the opportunity to, uh, to manage a football team and win football matches. Because when you see... A manager come through, win matches, like I see Eddie Al come through. You're looking at Chris Wilder now, Sean Dyer. You see how they're doing their stuff and they get themselves the right people around them. And you feel, I think I could do that. I think I could definitely delegate, Nathan. So I feel like I've missed the trick for myself, but it's something that I'm going to have to live with. Saul, you've been there. You've been on the front line. You've been managing mm. teams over the last couple of years. And... Mm. You've seen the harsh side of, of football management as well. Did Ian make the right decision in going the light entertainment route? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think for me, you know, like when, when you know, right through, you know, it, the badge, the, getting getting the badges, you know, the time it takes. Yeah, you know, I can understand sometimes if you if you if you slightly go off, say a, a couple of years, it's very hard to come back unless. Someone says, look, come over, be a striker coach and things like that. And then you can, there's, there's always a way back in. There's always a way back in. But um, sometimes, you, you know, it, you might just drift off too far and then and your kind of life is settled. And to come back again is, is very difficult. I, I've chosen, you know, to kind of step back, do, do my badges and slowly kind of, you know, you know, get into, get into that environment. And, you know, I've had two jobs. I'm... I'm looking for my third one. Just got to keep on kind of um, hoping, being in the right position, getting the right people around me, which I am, and slowly wait for that opportunity, the right opportunity to come so then I can kind of go, get the team uh, good, you know, solid around me so then when I do get that job, I can, you know, I've got the levers, I've got the support, and uh, and I can offer a lot more, to, uh, you know, to the, uh, to the team that I'm going into. I just got to get the right, the right club and, and it's not you know in and around this environment it's not easy um and i have to wait and be patient and that's really difficult when you've got passion for your for the game to be patient it's very hard uh it, it, it you you have to kind of almost come go within yourself and be silent and 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 don't allow the rage to kind of you know overflow that you're not in the game so what I'm going to do, I'm going to do, watch football, you know, maybe do some radio stuff and, and uh, you know, stay in the game because at the moment I can't go to, you know, training grounds and, and watch mm. training. It's very difficult, things like that. I used to do that a lot here and abroad to, to kind of get some more information, write the notes, speak to the manager, watch some games, see how they, see how all the, 
training how that transfers into the games and European game or normal league game, domestic game. So I used to do all that to kind of knowledge while I'm, while I'm not, you know, playing or, or so, uh, um, coaching, I'm learning. I'm learning from other managers. I, it's a little bit difficult now. I can't it's just for movement, but I can't wait to back, get back in. Um, yes, it's a difficult job to get back in because, you know, the time you can be in there nine months and you're out, you know, you've got to have impact. You've got to go in there very, very quickly. And, uh, and that's why you need the right team. So to give you the best opportunity to get the go, get uh, going, get the games, get, you know, the team uh, working and, and humming and, and singing off uh, of one hymn sheet. It's not always easy. I found it, you know, there's some, you know, the first two teams are very difficult. I'm just waiting for a team that is, you know, okay, settled and just needs the manager to kind of move them up to the next level. That's what I'm waiting. I've done my other side, you know, kind of saving clubs and trying to kind of, you know, um, uh, you know, revitalize, you know, a club that uh, is flagging. I don't want that anymore. I, I think I, you know, I deserve more than that now. I want a solid and stable club that needs a manager just to move them up to the next level, and I can do that. But I have to be patient, and that's the hardest thing sometimes. Unfortunately, we're still in a situation where there are so few black managers involved in the game that any black managers, particularly as high profile as yourself, almost need to come out and be a, a spokesperson and a representative for those managers and, and for the opportunities or lack of opportunities. Have things got better, do you feel? in recent years because it doesn't feel looking at the numbers they've got much better in terms of the opportunities that are there for BAME managers. Uh, I feel you know you're in a you know between a rock and a hard place. Do you speak out but then you might you know scare off people who might potentially uh, take you on or do you have to speak up because you know it is a it, it is a situation now you know you've got to look at the numbers don't even look at the numbers here look at the numbers you know across europe look at the numbers across the world you know there's a lot of black players who played probably want to get back in the game got their badges and they're not in the game and then the first thing also when you look down from you know say the manager the coaches and the you know the fitness guys uh, doctors you know all those things you look all the way down into the into the you know the, the, the lower uh, uh, areas of you know the under 16s and all, and all that it, it's you know you look down there it's probably scary the numbers as well of black you know um, managers uh, or coaches within or doctors or whatever in the game it's not a lot you know it, it's not just the top top kind of jobs is it's below it as well you have to be you know mindful of that so for me we need to kind of you know open up allow allow someone to you know like me to build my career i've seen guys build their career and win nothing you know they've been to four five six seven eight nine ten jobs and have gone sideways well give me a chance to build give me 10 decent clubs and and if it doesn't work after 10 decent clubs then okay it's fine but You've allowed someone to build their career, several people to build their careers, win nothing, and they're okay. Well, give me the chance to build my career and see where I end up and give me a platform like people like me, the right platform to kind of the right, you know, environment, you know, to kind of go on and give me the best chance to win. That's all I want to do. You know, sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes you have to build it. Sometimes you have to mold the players. Sometimes have to, I don't mind doing that, but give me a chance. Give me a platform. You know, uh, uh, you know, don't don't start me on minus ten. You know, start me on zero, so then I can build and I can go from there. So that's you know, it, there's a lot of talk. People are talking. You know, that's good, but it needs to kind of you know come into the you know get into the middle and. And, and have a situation that it moves forward. Because at the moment, it's it's kind of spread. It needs to kind of consolidate and really just pick off all the main things that we need uh, as, as a country, as, you know, as an association and everybody involved to make a, be a brighter future. It's got to, there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of huff and puffing and things like that and, and people looking back and looking forward, but really it's jobs and opportunities and give people a chance to kind of show what they can do. And what is it? What is it that should be done? Because you say it's not just managers, it's all aspects of the game, basically with the exception of players, that every part of a football club, they're more or less dominated by white people. So what can be done? If you're talking to me, and I don't know if you're having conversations with people who are currently in power, what yeah, Nathan, can be done? Go on, Nathan, Ian. Nathan, Nathan it's, very, it's a very difficult and hard question for someone like, as a black man and a, like, so being a black man, to answer simply because you're asking 
people are marginalised, and people we haven't got we haven't got the levels of people at the management level to go up to be able to give you the opportunities to do that. You say, what can you do? Who do we go to? We don't even know who to go to. You know what I mean? I don't know what. You know, it's like you, you, you see with Soul. So what Soul's saying is, Soul has not got the opportunity to manage a team where there's been jobs that have come up um, of a team that he can actually work with, a team that's got very good players, a team that's got a little bit of money, so as he can have, like he's saying, the same opportunities. Now, why? I don't know. So to ask, to, to ask something like, well, what can you do? To, we haven't got the answers. And like for Sol to continue to try and answer it because he's under unfair pressure in respect of what he's trying to do. Because remember, if Sol gets a job, it doesn't go well. Bam. Look, you know what I mean? We're talking about one of the most decorated black players. You know, one of the most decorated players in the, um, in the English game. Can't get the same jobs as certain people. But the fact is, he's ready to go. He's ready to take the pressure, the undue pressure, what other people don't have to take. But you just need somebody to give you a chance. It just needs a chance. Mm. What have you made of what's gone on over the past six months, I guess, particularly in English football, uh, Ian, in terms of the stance that the players have taken? Not even the last six months, because Raheem Sterling has obviously been very vocal over the last few years. But the fact now that we have players taking a knee before every match, you even see, and look at American sports, it's gone to another level again, where teams are threatening to boycott. Like, Do you feel this is a change that is making a real impact? Or is it actually, again, just it takes a few boxes for people? and Or does it get to a stage, potentially, where it takes a few boxes? Um, no. No, no, no. Not this, not this particular time, because what happened with George Floyd is, is literally people have stopped. And what's happened is, is white people, more importantly, have said, right, no, we want to change. The conversation has changed. Um, the Premier League have done brilliantly because they've drawn their line in the sand with the Black Lives Matter. I think that when we first saw the guys go down on the knee, Sheffield United and Aston Villa, magnificent, powerful, brilliant. It's, um, it's, it shows that they're all together, they're unified. And when you look at the guys who are involved with the platforms that they have and the people that they're able to reach, they can keep it going. And that's what has got to happen, really. It's just the conversation has to keep going. We have to have the uncomfortable conversation, not black people. White people have to have it, because this, this only gets traction when white people get involved in and had enough. That's when, the, that's when things move, is that when they've had enough. And that's what's happened with this particular one. White people have drawn a line and said, no, I'm not just going to stay silent now. I'm not going to just, I'm not going to stay silent. I'm going to be anti-racist. So if, I, if I'm at a, a dinner table, if I'm, I'm going to, I'm going, to put, I'm going to say something in here that's going to change the conversation. So it's not just black people who have to constantly try to explain. Well, no, no, no. It's white people who are trying to understand because then they can get into the conversation. That's what's happened with this movement. That's what's happened with this movement. And that's why it's gaining traction. Do you see that as well, Saul, that this was a line in the sand? I feel it, it's, um, it's, it's quite funny that something has to happen in America for it to really reverberate over here. We've had our time moments to kind of move things, but I feel with that, you know, tragic kind of, you know, incident, it's transferred over it and it's and it's gone global. And the conversation, like Wright was saying, is is white people having that conversation now. It's not black people trying to explain everything. It's like, you know, I actually want to learn and listen, and I didn't even know this was going on. And that's that's the trouble. People have woke up. White people have woke up, and and the and the sensitive sensitive ones who who are, you know are open minded have have sometimes it's just dawned on them that I didn't know I was actually doing that. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know. Um, I'm sorry. I've got to look at this properly. I've got to look at my kids and things like that. I've got to look at my friends. I've got to look at my friends. Listen, and maybe correct my friends when, when at a dinner table, things like that. It's, it's all changed. The narrative has changed. And now the upper echelons, their conversations have changed as well because it's a, it's a global thing and, and everybody is connected somehow, somehow. If it's connection, if it's money, if it's kind of being kind of outspoken or whatever, everyone's connected now, and the right people are talking the right conversations now. 
it's gone up to that level. It's gone to, you know, it was the government level, but now the powers, the, the power people in radio, the power people in papers, the power people in, you know, in media, Obviously, you know, that sort of now, maybe the power in, in film has to has to follow suit as well. You know, it all needs to trickle down so everybody kind of, you know, wakes up and realise what situation they're in. And it's not make-believe. It's not, oh, no, that, is that really happening? No, it is really happening. But the conversation is happening now. People are changing, slowly are changing their, their outlook and, their, and how they look at a black player, at a black manager, at a black personality. It's changed. It has changed, but and also research has changed. You know, I, I think the PFA did something. I, I'm not too sure if it was the uh, a Norwegian company or Danish company. They went out to all the kind of major leagues and and um, collected the information, the whole season, collected information uh, of and then also America of how commentators, you know, how they describe a black player or a, a white player or, or, or a light skinned player, things like that. And it's, it's unbelievable. A black player was like, oh, beast and all that. And then say a white or lighter skin, oh, finesse. And all those things, all those subliminal things over year after year after year, that slips into the consciousness of people. And then they don't know they actually have a different kind of look at a certain person. That needs to change. That narrative has to change, you know, into the system, into the consciousness. And then, you know, the guy who is 30 and then becomes 50 and he owns a football club, he might be, you know, had a 20 years of actually looking at black players in a more different way, in an intelligent way. I said, you know what, I'm going to have him. That's the, I think that's the problem. We've had 20 years of people just saying that we're just strong and this and that and blah, blah, blah. But no finesse, no intelligence. Can't run a, can't run a football club. It's too confusing. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Ian, what Saul said there about attitudes changing towards players, towards managers. When you look at the modern day player right now, and like Gary Neville was talking at the weekend about Mason Greenwood and the treatment that was dished out to Mason Greenwood, who was in the exact same incident as Phil Foden, and they were both very stupid and made a mistake, but they're young boys. Yet it's not Phil Foden who's in the paper six days later for making another silly mistake, but you know, nothing major. It's Mason Greenwood. That modern day players face a different sort of racism from what you faced 20, 30 years ago. It's, it's done in a different way through the media. It's not, as, it's not as open, it's not as overt, but it's still there subliminally. Yeah, but the thing is, is that I, I said, I, ma I made a quote the other day about um, the, the Martin Luther King generation, which I believe was, was mine. I think so kind of like um, can be put in that way, where you do have to turn the other cheek, come into the dressing room and you deal with what's just happened to you. Um, but like we're dealing now with the Malcolm X generation who can do something about it by any means necessary. And like I said, they've got the platforms to be able to do it and they've got the followers and to be able to, to get their points across and make people hear what they've got to say and, and make change. That's what it comes down to, making change. You know, you look at, you know, the thing is, is that people sometimes feel that, oh, here goes, here's another black guy talking about um, racism. Oh, here we go, probably go and make a cup of tea. But when I heard Ben Me, Ask. He asked to. I want to do an interview with the, with the, um, with the, with the banner and everything that was going on at Burnley. And when Ben Mee came out and spoke so eloquently about racism, somebody that no one would have thought would be speaking about it. He got that message across like nobody else could. Because what we've seen there is somebody that you're not expecting explain himself and 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 say to it's not acceptable. And this is what I'm talking about. The uncomfortable conversation and when i saw that that was as powerful and as good as anything i've seen anybody do on the television because that is what makes people listen yeah that is massive true. ally massive ally and me no longer enough just to say you're not racist you need to be Absolutely. overtly anti-racist we do have some other questions coming through over the last few days uh Paulie fahi was wondering what do you think you would have been doing profession wise if you didn't make it as footballers well i guess Ian, you sort of know this because you were almost there. Um, yeah, but like now, as time's gone by, I think by now I probably would have ended up being a lawyer or a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. You, you, you I'd have been a really, really good role. plasterer. A really I'd good plasterer. I'd have been plasterer. an excellent plasterer by now. Excellent plasterer. Because Just... I quite enjoyed it. I quite liked building. I think the guy who, was, who, who, I was, who I was working with, he didn't have a lot of patience with me. You know, teaching me the different bonds, the Flemish bond, the English bond, this and that, when I was doing the brickwork. And, you know, when, when I really started to get into it, 
I ended up, you know what I mean, it, it, football came knocking, but I would have liked to have think, thought, I should say, I'd have ended up doing something um, in the building game. I would have definitely been a builder, bricklayer, plasterer, all that stuff. Sol? Uh, knowing what I, the things that I like, I, I, I like a little bit like um, writing, I love the building game, but also maths. So, so, and I love to build, I love the angles. So for me, I'm all, more of a architect, an architect, architect for me. Yeah, I love building things. I love, I'm not a, a natural drawer, but I know maths and the systems and I do like how to build and the physics side and mm. architects for me. Well, you could have designed so me and Sol could do something together. Exactly, who knows? Yeah, there you go. Maybe there's an opportunity <laughs> coming out of this for the two of you. A question for you, Sol. <laughs> You scored at the 2002 World Cup, you made the team of the tournament, and you were an invincible with Arsenal. But would you swap any of those for a Champions League medal in 2006? That's from Gar Tuhi. Uh, they should have said the World Cup, more like win the World Cup. I'll definitely swap mm -hmm. it for that. Um, do you know what? Winning the league is, 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 is incredible. You know, you are the champions of your country. You're the best team. You're part of the best team. You can't beat that, really. Champions League, don't get me wrong. I'm so, you know, I wish we, you know, we scored an extra goal and, and killed off Barcelona. It'd be fantastic. But for me, you know, winning and being the champions of, of the country, you can't beat that. I mean, Ian knows that. That's the that special yeah. thing. You, you, you're at the top. Yeah. Everyone's below you. Uh, you've worked. You've gone ups and downs. We're in the season. Uh, all the kind of tuberations. And you got there. You got over the line. And you've won. And it's something that will be with you for the rest of your life yeah. um and it's beautiful to kind of have that that type of memories uh to kind of uh, give you comfort as uh, you know uh, over the years so for me it, it's it's the league joe mcguire wondering who's your biggest sporting icon heen muhammad ali for me no question muhammad ali was um was not only unbelievable um athlete, un unbelievably intelligent man, but like a real, real I iconic inspiration. An icon. Muhammad Ali. Sal? I'd have to agree with, uh, with writing Muhammad Ali. You know, he, he stood for things. He saw things way before anyone else. You know, he's very, very clever about, you know, the you know, what was going on, you know, in the 60s and in America, things like that. He was he, iconic. He was in with all, you know, the major movers to kind of, you know, uh, move uh, black America on at the time. And um, But then he could speak. He was intelligent. Just imagine if he went to he, he, Oxford University or whatever. You just never know. Um, you know, it, it's incredible. And he couldn't, you know, he was, you know, writing-wise was obviously hard for him, but speaking was just, he was like a poet. He was mm. like a philosopher. He was, he was unbelievable. And he was black. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just incredible. And he could box. <laughs> it was, it was just the, the best. You know, the strongest man, you know, you know, the toughest man in the whole world. And the iconic fights he had. And character-wise, you know, for me, you know, in, in Zaire, those boxing matches, you know, it's unbelievable. But historical moments, real historical moments. And... It, and it's all got filmed at the same time. It's just incredible. It's like people knew that, let me just follow this guy because something's big happening with this guy around. And uh, and he took it on. And it's such a shame, obviously, he's not around. But what a man. I mean, and in, in the era of, like, you know, you had to watch yourself and, you know, you can walk down the street and you could be you know, disappeared the next second, you know, in America, what are still happening now anyway. But, you know, he was he was there. He was a, he was a beacon. He was a beacon of lights as well. It, it's definitely him. Just to finish up then, from Gordon Williams, how do you see Arsenal doing in the Premier League? We might turn on to what is going on in, in football at the moment. Uh, Ian, how do you see Arsenal getting on this season? I'm very excited about the way Arsenal are playing. I think you can only look at the last three games and the, and the opponents they've played. Of course, Fulham was, um, was a kind of opponent that you'd expect Arsenal to, dis to dispatch like they did. But, the, but there's a lot of positives in the way that they've played when they played against Liverpool, Manchester City, the fact that they understand what the manager wants, what the coach wants, um, and the way they're playing, there's a confidence. And then obviously with Aubameyang, uh, in respect of a finisher, um, 
there's now a lot of optimism around the club. And I think that comes from the manager, the belief in the players, the culture change in the dressing room, the intensity, what he's instilled in there, and the fact that they are being coached magnificently right now. I'm, I've already gone on record as saying that the way Arsenal played against the top teams in, in, in recent years, um, you know, they didn't do very well because I didn't think they had a plan. They lacked intensity and they lacked organisation under Arsene Wenger's last couple of years. Same with Unai Emery. There did seem to be a lot of a bit of a communication problem. They weren't playing the brand of football that he said that he was going to bring, but now under Mikel Arteta they are, and they can catch those top teams on the break if they're going to try and retain possession and um, try and, and and try and beat Arsenal through a passing system. Arsenal will then hit them on a the break and beat them, and then they'll beat the teams like Fulham. So I'm probably going to go with Arsenal to finish in the top four, Nathan, simply because I feel that that's the goal of the manager and the players. That's what they're going to go for. Hopefully that can happen. If they do go on to be successful in over the next couple of years, have you played a big role in that? Because it does seem as though you've become some sort of a advisor for Pierre Emerick Aubameyang. I don't know if you're officially his agent at this stage, but it does seem as though you <laughs> you played a key role in getting him to commit his future to the club. No, 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 I didn't know. They they done what they were doing. You know, what I mean, being in contact with him because I've been in contact with him from literally the first um, first minutes he's walked through the club. We've always had a kind of. Um, uh, there's been always been a, a, a channel open for com communication. But obviously, in that time, you know what I mean, it was too sensitive. You know what I mean? He, he, he wasn't saying, like, Ian, I'm going to do this, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. The fact is, is that I was a, an, an ear for him, a friend for him. He knows how much I love the club. He knows how much I love him. And whatever he would have come, whatever decision he would have come to, we'd have had to accept it. Um, it's not like I, you know what I mean, I speak to the dad through interpreter and all that sort of stuff. And we were all very hopeful that things were going to happen. And that's what happened. But no, I'm not any closer in respect to getting it to sign it or do anything. I'm just like a normal Arsenal fan who was desperate for him to sign because I know that everything I just said about Arsenal and their success is going to rely on that man. He's probably going to be the focal point of that. So... I'm just making sure that, in, like everybody else, I was answering stuff on Twitter and on Instagram to get him to know that I'm amongst the fans who want him to stay. That's how it went, Nathan. And, simple, and, simple as that. And maybe some similarities between his story and yours. Came to Arsenal at quite a late yeah. age, in his 20s, when things weren't going particularly well, but suddenly in the latter years actually gets the success. And even if you are just coming in your latter years, you can be a real hero at that club. You can, you can get your statue, you can get your picture up there at the side of the Emirates. That, that's, <laughs> yes. what's, that's what's on offer for him. And you know the thing about it is, is that you know what when when Pierre, when he was in, in in at Dortmund, he was linked with everybody, and I don't know where it came from about his his personality and what he's about because what he he's got beautiful cars, he's got very you know he's got he's got unbelievable clothes full of colours. You can you can look at uh, uh, Abamyang and he'll probably have every colour of clothing, every colour on his clothing on at one stage. But like for people to get that confused with him as a person, the party guy, could not be any... It couldn't be further from the truth. He's a family man who is totally dedicated to playing football. And when you watch how he plays, when you watch how even if one of his teammates don't pass to him when he's in a better position, he never complains. He never... He's always smiling. And I'm quite pleased that they didn't take the chance on him and he did come to Arsenal because everybody around the club and everybody who meets him, you can see that this guy is the genuine article. He's the nicest man you will ever meet as a footballer that is at the highest, at the peak of his powers. He's my friend, and I'm really pleased and privileged to be able to call him that. And I'm very proud um, of him and the way he's carried himself. He's got an unbelievable team around him, and I'm just delighted he's at our club. I, cannot, I can't express that anymore. Yeah, it's pretty high praise for Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. Sol, he will be key if Arsenal are to achieve something this season. Uh, Ian touched on it there. The big difference, it seems, already, even though Mikel Arteta is there less than a year, like they look like a team who are coached very, very well when you see the quality of goals they've scored over the last few matches. I think, obviously, with uh, Arteta coming in, he, he's learned a hell of a lot from uh, Pep, for sure. He's taken that, uh, how he's... Um, for sure, he might have he, he has his own kind of style, but you know systems and taking the best bits from Pep. For sure, he must have taken that, and uh, he's incorporating in his own style. 
He knows the club. He knows uh, how desperate the club is to to get back to the top. Uh, and he and he he feels that as well. He feels he, he, you know when you have a manager like that who understands the club, understands the fans, understands the importance of of getting back there and how to get back there and the sacrifices you, you, to get back there and 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 what gets you there as well and what not gets you there. So obviously you know he had to make some tough decisions to to kind of move certain players you know back you know either bench or in the stands or stay at home. And he's and he's managed to do that. You know, there's some players I'm not going to mention have got out of line and they've kind of disappeared. They're kind of they're young as well, but they've just overstepped the mark. I think that sets the tone. Before, you know, maybe years before that, maybe you know, a little bit uh, under you know the, the the Wenger area, that would have got away. That they would have got away with that. Some of the young players would have got away. It's not happening now. They could be all being put into line. Or you, or you kind of you're, you're not marginalised, but you've moved and you've got to wake up. If you don't wake up, you, you can stay, and then eventually you can move on. And for me, that just breeds the right mentality. The young players see that as, oh, I can't get away with this. Uh, I want to, I want a career. I'm not gonna. The manager or the system is not gonna allow me to muck around. That's what you want at a club now, where people don't muck around. There's a time to muck around. There's a time to you know to knuckle down and make sure your life is is right on and off the field. And and that's what you know, Mikel uh, has got now. He's got players who who want to play for the club, uh, want to make a career. They want to muck around. They want to just pick up a paycheck. You know, want to do something. Want to want to create something. Want to be someone whilst they're playing the wonderful game of football. Mm. If Arsenal, if the aim is top four, then looking at the title, Liverpool going for back to back. Uh, I suspect Saul that Virgil Van Dijk is very much a Saul Campbell type of defender. Yeah, I think you know he's 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 like that was a missing link. You know, um, you know, obviously they've got a wonderful keeper as well, but. That was the missing link. They 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 were looking for that centre half and also goalkeeper to really solidify and strengthen that that uh, that back line. If he gets injured, there is a you know they're still strong. Don't get me wrong, but that kind of coolness and the and the kind of um, uh, control in the back line, control in the back the back line uh, will, will definitely miss if he's injured. So you know he needs to you know play majority of the games and be around because if he isn't there, you know, you, you just never know. Liverpool, you know, they've got a great side even without him. But when he's there, you know, nine times out of ten, that solid, um, you know, back line, it's something for Liverpool to build on. It's not going to be easy. You know, it's never easy to do back-to-back -back, uh you know, I, I didn't do it at Arsenal, but it's so difficult to do the back because everybody's gunning for you now. Everybody's improved. You know, some players have re rejuvenated. They just want to go for you. So it's always difficult to win, you know, back to back kind of. Uh, and also the expectation now is even more now uh, on Liverpool. But I think they still got it. I think if they, if everyone plays, they still got I think the best side. But it's gonna it's gonna come down whether all of them are really truly up for it week in week out, week in week out, week in week out. Because sometimes when you win, you might drop off a couple of games, but that's that you drop off a couple of games allows your opposition to come in and gain the ground and and make it difficult all the way to the to the end for you to win. So it's gonna we're gonna find that it's the attitude right for them. Yes, they're, they're still gonna do it properly and they're still gonna be professional, but that little extra bit that takes you away from the rest of the pack. Let's see if they still got it. Ian, would you have been able to get at Virgil Van Dijk? Would you been able to rattle him? Uh, I wouldn't want to play against Virgil. I think he's. For me right now, um, him and Sergio Ramos, and I know Sergio is getting to that stage of his career, but easily the best two in the world. People are going crazy about what he made a mistake the other day and when they won the league, when they literally won the league and, you know, Liverpool were in that state of, like, that where Neil was in the Matrix, that train station where he couldn't go anywhere. That's where, that's where, that's where Liverpool were playing those end-of-the-season games. And people are trying to judge Virgil van Dijk on those games in a game at the start of the season against uh, against Leeds. He's getting he's cocky. He's getting cocky. Best. Is that not, is that not what's happening? Huh? He's getting cocky. Who? Van Dijk. Is that not well, why he's making that mistake? Virgil, Virgil van Dijk, Virgil van Dijk has not played any differently to um, to when he's first come in. The first couple of years when he's flawless. He's still doing the same things. You know, at the end of the day, for, for, for you, to, for you to think that he's he's being cocky, that he's doing nothing different, Nathan. He's playing exactly the same. What's going to happen is, is that people are going to put him under more pressure. 
You know, he's made a couple of mistakes, so people are going to look at him and say, right, let's see how he goes. I guarantee you Virgil van Dijk will still be, at the end of this season, one of the players that's going to be... Virgil's fine. He's not cocky at all. No way. He's, he's the total opposite. He's a leader. So are you back in Liverpool to defend the title? Absolutely, game? yeah. I'm, I'm going with Liverpool again. Um, I, I agree with Sol. They're, you know, they're going to... If they can get Thiago Calacantara, if they can get that, that would be a kind of a missing link. Um, they've got to get Firmino firing. You know, um, I think that the mere fact that they were interested in Timo Werner says to me they may have been a bit worried about the goals. He scored, what, what I think he scored one goal at home last season. Mm. It's not good enough when you consider what Liverpool are going to have to fight off. Um, I think their intensity will still be there, but a, one signing of that calibre will give them the kind of um, lift like what Dennis Burkamp gave us. It's that kind of player what other players in the dressing room look at and say, wow, yes, I want to impress him. So let's hope Liverpool get that signing, but I'm still going to go with them whether they get him or not. All right. And for you, Sal? Yeah, I think they've, you know, they have to, as a team, if they all, if they all, you know, coming, coming back, the interruption of last season, it's kind of a mixed bag. Of, you know, they, People say they limped over the line. They've got there. You know, if the, if the season didn't uh, stop, they would have just got there easy, and uh, it would be just like a, a smooth, you know, <laughs> smooth Rolls Royce, just you know, to the end. Because that kind of break, that break in the season, they got to start. They got to get back into the groove. You know, they're top players. They will get back into the groove, and they will click. And and once they click, then they're gonna start, you know, uh, firing all cylinders. The front three have to, you know, get back to that kind of uh, the menacing and, and, you know, any kind of sniff and all scoring goals for left and right and centre and uh, creating chances. Um, once they get that back together again, they're going to be, you know, the, the formidable side and they're going to be, you know, they'll be the ones to catch. You know, Man City might be there, who knows, but if they get that intensity and that, that, that anger in their play and we don't want to lose, then it's going to be difficult for everyone else. All right, two for Liverpool it is. This has been the second of this year's OTB Sports Remote Roadshows in partnership with Cabri FC. Check out cabriefc.com for updates on promotions and giveaways. That is us done. My thanks to our brilliant guests, Ian Wright and Saul Campbell. You've been brilliant with your time. Thanks Whoa. a million, lads. Thanks, Nave. Thanks, Nave. It's thanks been a pleasure. To, thanks to Ian and to Sol and to Cabri FC for helping make this happen. And also keep an eye on all our social channels because we have more of this goodness to come over the coming weeks. We're going to be announcing some more amazing guests very, very soon. We'll talk to you soon.